Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today and wonderful Wednesday. And today we're going to talk about the cardiac output multiplex. What's the best method, which there is no answer to that, and how do I use different methods to evaluate my patient's cardiac output? And so to begin, we'll just take a quick look at a patient. You can see here's a patient that's multiple uh, different types of monitoring equipment. We have a Philips monitor for echocardiogram. We have a EV1000, we have an echocardiogram, we're in ventilation, we have multiple drips, and this is a really sick patient. And our really sick patient, of course, the first thing that's going to happen is when our patient is hypotensive, we have a couple of really important questions. Should we give fluids? Should we withhold fluids? How is your LV working? How is your RV working? Is your cardiac output adequate? And how much is the cardiac output? And we can see that our patient is quite hypotensive, has a diagnosis of community-acquired pneumonia with septic shock and H1N1 uh, a virus. And he's poorly oxygenated with a lot of PEEP that's being administered from the ventilator. So we look at this patient and the simplicity of looking only at blood pressure actually belies the importance of all the other different components of what we consider to be important. Now, I think it's really vital for us to appreciate that we're always having a goal to optimize outcomes on our patients. And we talk about goals in two ways when we're talking about hemodynamic optimization and cardiac output. First is goal-directed therapy, which means you set a goal and you make the patient fit the goal. So you set a hemodynamic goal. I want that cardiac output to be four, or I want the cardiac index to be 2.8. You set the goal, and then everything you do is about getting the patient to that goal. But actually, the preferred method, and what most of us do, is hemodynamic optimization, which is actually looking at the patient, taking into account all the criteria that would include indices of tissue perfusion, like base deficit, anion gap, serum bicarb, and actually altering your goals to fit your patient. So the first thing that's really important is at the beginning of every shift and every day that you're caring for a critical patient is to know the goal and to plot how you're going to get there, to give up when one methodology isn't working and move on to another methodology. But in order for us to be able to do that, we, we really do need to have some method, whether it's non-invasive, minimally invasive or invasive, some method to actually help us evaluate the cardiac output. Reminding ourselves that cardiac output is, of course, heart rate times stroke volume, and it's expressed in liters per minute, normal cardiac output, which is sort of a misnomer. Normal cardiac output is a cardiac output between four to eight liters per minute, and optimizing that cardiac output in order to answer the tissue demand for oxygen. So that means you are gonna have the reduction of metabolic acidosis and improvement of the base deficit the anion gap, the serum bicarb, et cetera. Cardiac index, which is the patient's cardiac output actually adjusted to their body size, gives you a much more meaningful indicator of your blood flow dynamics for your patient because it's optimized to the patient's body surface area. And we always wanna remind ourselves there's lots of determinants of cardiac output that are standard for us to talk about. Heart rate preload after low contractility, but always important for us to remember that when we're evaluating our patients, any indicator that we see that the patient is attempting to increase their cardiac output, the most important one being their heart rate, is an indicator that the tissues are demanding more oxygen. So very, very important to appreciate that the clinical indicators, and, and there's a few, the basic clinical indicators like heart rate and respiratory rate can be utilized to help us appreciate whether cardiac output is appropriate and adequate for our patient. Okay, so we talk about the basic factors which affect cardiac output. So first of all, heart rate is a major factor. And that's what we look at most of the time. When the heart rate is increased, you're assuming that the cardiac output is increased because cardiac output, remember, is heart rate times stroke volume. What we really want to treat, however, in our patients is stroke volume. And stroke volume is an indicator of ventricular efficiency. It really tells us about the validity of the filling of the ventricle and the contraction and ejection from the ventricle. And we use three different 
primary tools when we're talking about treating patients with cardiac for cardiac output. The first one is the one that's the most common. It's the one we talk about all the time, and that is giving patients volume. Now we give patients volume in order to increase the stretch of the ventricle. We give volume assuming that the ventricle is compliant, that the ventricle is stretched with the volume that we give. And it's really important to remember that that is not always going to be the case. Oftentimes, we have ischemic ventricles that don't accept volume very well, and therefore the filling pressure of the ventricle goes up aggressively when you give volume. Filling pressure that we normally measure would be our central venous pressure. That's the filling pressure to the right ventricle. And the right ventricle should normally be very descendable and really compliant. So when you give volume, your CVP shouldn't go up very much. If you're giving volume and CVP goes up a lot, that may mean that your patient is not going to be able to accept that volume, move it forward through the pulmonary vault, move it forward to the LV, and move it forward into the systemic arteries. So that's always something we're going to ask. We also treat cardiac output, uh, and, and actually we limit your cardiac output when we start you on vasoactive drips. Now, remember, we start you on a vasoactive drip, and I should say vasoconstriction. So norepinephrine, epinephrine, uh, dopamine, neosinephrine, vasopressin, angiotensin II, all those agents which promote vasoconstriction are going to significantly limit your cardiac output or your stroke volume. That's just something that you have to know as you're titrating up on your patient's vasoactive drips. To maintain their blood pressure, you may actually limit their stroke volume. So again, your responsibility is always to look at that endpoint, whether or not the patient got more acidotic or less acidotic, which will tell you whether you've improved or disimproved the cardiac output. And of course, last but not least is the contractile component of the ventricle, which we treat with inotropes. The most common inotrope is ionized calcium, and then the continuous inotrope, which is dobutamine. Don't confuse dobutamine with preload or afterload. Dobutamine is about contractility. And whenever you increase the contractile mechanism of the ventricle, you actually put the ventricle at risk for an ischemic burden. So Utilizing inotropes is always done with extraordinary care. And in general, nurses cannot titrate inotropes without a doctor's order. That's in order to protect the ventricle from an ischemic burden. Okay. Oops, I think I went backwards, sorry. So when the goal is to optimize cardiac output, and when isn't it? I mean, that's always your goal. You have to actually consider that the cardiac output that you're most concerned with is the cardiac output of delivery of blood flow into the systemic arteries. So of course we appreciate that cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And if I'm talking about left ventricular cardiac output, that means I have to look at a thoracic measure using something like the Starling uh, monitor or an arterial measure uh, in our institution using FlowTrack and other places using a LIDCO or a PICO that actually looks at arterial volume. And, and from that arterial ejection is the correlation of cardiac output. Now, it's really important to remember when you're at the bedside, right? Heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output. But mean arterial pressure is cardiac output which is heart rate times stroke volume, times vascular resistance. So as your vascular resistance goes up, your MAP may stay the same or go up, but cardiac output will go down. That's really important to remember as you are aggressively titrating vasoactive drips that you're going to limit some of the cardiac output, which is why if you have an A-line or if you don't have an A-line, find another way to actually evaluate and optimize your cardiac output so that when you are treating your pressure, your blood pressure, you are not limiting your cardiac output. So really important to remember the essence of cardiac output that we're concerned about is the stroke volume. And what's really important is that stroke volume mimics ejection fraction. It looks at end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. So filling and what's left after ejection, optimize filling, what's left after ejection. And again, really important to remember that our goal is to, when we increase preload by giving volume, we assume your stroke volume will increase. When we give vasoactive agents, vasopressors for your blood pressure, we're going to assume that your stroke volume is going to go down. 
And when we give an inotrope, we assume that your stroke volume will go up. Now that's really, really important because we don't always approach our patients with that knowledge and that understanding and that concern. Important to remember that normal stroke volume is 6,100 mLs per beat, but you can go up to about 200 mLs per beat. And patients will do that in order to answer the cellular demand for oxygen. So that's of course, always very important. But the number one reason that we give volume is we're assuming that if we give volume, we will increase the end diastolic volume and you will have a better proportional ejection of volume. But that's a big assumption because again, your assumption is that the ventricle can accept the volume that you gave it and eject the volume that you gave it. This is why you've got to have a methodology to look at stroke volume. Just lately being on, just a few minutes ago, being on the sepsis call, you know, there's always a discussion about giving volume in sepsis patients. Well, the truth of the matter is the evolution in all of our sepsis guidelines are trying to evolve to having a target for your volume resuscitation, that just giving volume can actually cause volume overload in a patient who cannot accept that volume, meaning that the ventricle is nice and compliant or cannot eject it, meaning that the ventricle is relatively contractile. So that comes back to our ability to monitor our patients and to think about monitoring cardiac output. So there's lots of clinical signs, but those clinical signs may not be early or accurate enough to actually tell me whether the patient has adequate blood flow. So we really think about the adequacy of blood flow, not just the numbers. We think about end organ perfusion. Are you confused? Do you have an altered mental status? Are you making urine? Are you producing lactate at the tissue level? Uh, what's your capillary refill? How are your pulses? What's your skin temp and your skin color? But these are not always early indicators and they are not always accurate. But it is important to remember that there is something that can be very, very helpful to us. And that is what we call pulse pressure, which is systole minus diastole. Pulse pressure correlates with stroke volume. So when we're looking at a patient now, of course, that means you're monitoring it continuously, not intermittently. Intermittent measures really don't give us much guidance. But if we are continuously monitoring arterial pressure, we can look at continuous pulse pressure, which is systole minus diastole, and that's going to correlate with your stroke volume. There are some other things that we can use clinically that don't require any extra equipment that's already embedded in your monitor. The most important one is called the PERF or the perfusion index. And of course, the evaluation of the waveform of the PLETH. And that's what your perfusion index is correlated to, your PLETH waveform of your pulse oximeter. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Okay. So our patient's gotten two liters of saline or lactate ringers, whatever it is you're using. And a lot of times in the very first volume resus, patients get saline. And he's been started on epinephrine at mics per kg per hour, which is the preferred methodology, 0 0.6 mics per kg per hour. So it depends on the patient's weight, how much they're actually receiving, correct? Because it's a weight-based drug. And now our question is, as we're treating his hypotension, should we be monitoring cardiac output in this patient at this stage? And of course, the answer you would know is yes. Of course, what else? Why else would I put this patient up there? Yes, of course, we need to monitor cardiac output. So we're going to think about the multiplex of cardiac output. We don't have all these capabilities. No one on this call has all these capabilities. We have to pick and choose from three different categories invasive cardiac output. That requires that you have a PA catheter. You may use a FIC calculation based on the data from your PA catheter, but performing a FIC is, requires that you have a pulmonary artery catheter. Minimally invasive, which typically is measured from an arterial line or looking at bioimpedance in the chest uh, or a continuous echocardiogram, uh, uh, what we call an uh, uh, an uh, I'm sorry, what we call a cardio Q, which is an indwelling transesophageal echo probe that nurses can place and maintain. Some of us have that, some of us don't. And then non-invasive. And non-invasive can be measured by entitled CO2, partial gas rebreathing. Again, 
those bioimpedance pads that are placed on the chest, we have that capability that's called the Starling monitor. Pulsatile cardiac output measured by a similar PLETH technology. In our institution, we have that availability that's called the clear sight. You might not know you have it, but you do have it, and you have it almost everywhere. Uh, and of course, looking at endotracheal echocardiogram, that's the ECOM, and Doppler methodologies using uh, some of our physicians really prefer like bedside pulsatile evaluation with the Doppler technology. That can be quite beneficial as well. So there's a lot of plethora, lots of capabilities that we can think about when we're monitoring cardiac output on our patients. I'm gonna start with non-invasive. So first and foremost, I wanna talk about something that you may or may not know is embedded for people who work at Grady and anybody who's using a Philips monitor or using Masimo technology for their pulse oximeter, it's already embedded in your monitor. Uh, and that's called the perfusion index. It's called PI from Masimo or PERF embedded in your Philips monitor. So really all you have to do is turn this on. It's a digital display that actually tells you about the perfusion index, the pulsatile quality of blood flow to your PLETH signal. And it gives you very significant numbers that you can evaluate to tell you about perfusion. Now, this is not cardiac output, but it is an indicator for perfusion. So perfusion index overall, and whether it's called PERF or PI, it doesn't matter, is the ratio of the pulsatile blood flow versus the non-pulsatile or the venous blood flow in the peripheral tissue. Now, the reason this is important is that in older technologies, in technologies outside of Philips or outside of Massimo, you actually are looking at both arterial flow and venous flow. And frequently that means that you're going to, you're going to under predict what the patient's actual pulse ox is. So that's why this was developed was to actually help validate the PLETH signal for pulse ox symmetry. But it's also a non-invasive measurement of pulsatile perfusion. So what you can see when you are evaluating this, when you've turned on the digital parameter on your Philips monitor called PERF, what you are actually doing is looking at the quality of perfusion. And so PI is again with Massimo technology, that's not what you have on your Philips monitor, but if you're using Massimo technology, the lower the number 0.1 or less, the poorer the blood flow, the higher the number, the better the blood flow. The same thing is going to be true with the perfusion numeric, which is what's embedded on your Philips monitor, provides a value to tell you about your pulsatile portion. So first and foremost, you have to have a pleth, right? You've got to have blood flow to get a pleth. And then you turn on that perfusion uh, parameter, it's just a it's just a digital that says, oh, your patient has a perfusion of two or three or five. Anything less than one is very profoundly poor perfusion. Now you probably already knew that because you didn't have a very good pleth and you may not have been able to get a pulsatile signal. But did you know that you have this on every Philips monitor that has been made in the last 30 years, you have this capability. Most folks don't even know about it. They don't understand it. They don't use it. So it's a really important perspective to remember that, uh, and when this is perfusion index, so all I'm going to do is transpose the numbers for perf with Phillips. You would like your number to be greater than one, okay? And greater than Three means you have a very good perfusion. So now I'm going to show it to you. This is using the Masimo technology. And with the Masimo technology, what you get is the perfusion index. And remember, anything greater than one is going to be of benefit to the patient. So we have a nice pulsatile signal. We're reading a very good pulse ox. Here's your heart rate. And here is your perfusion index. So that's what's displayed on your Masimo bedside monitor if that's what you're using. But here, this number right here and circled in the green, because this was from a comparative study, but here circled in the green is your perf from your Philips monitor from the pulsatile signal embedded in your technology. It's called the fast SPO2 of your Philips monitor. You can turn this on 
and have an idea about your patient's perfusion quality. And your goal would be to get that somewhere close to five. It's gonna change all the time based on the patient's position, the position uh, of the sensor, but it's a really great way for you to just correlate blood flow dynamics. Now that's not cardiac output, but it gives you information about perfusion. That's number one invasive. Secondly, I'm gonna just quickly mention the clear site. The clear site is a, a monitor that is attached to your hemisphere and your EV1000s. So if you are using flow track monitoring in your intensive care unit, if you have a more recent monitor, you may have a white box down on the bottom, down at the bottom of your IV pole, that's your clear site monitor. Not all of our flow track monitors have the capability for you to use ClearSight, but ClearSight uses a basic pulsatile cuff. It's called a finipress method, which is inflate, deflate, inflate, deflate, and it does that every half second. And what it's actually doing is looking at the pulsatile flow under the occlusive cuff, and it will display that as an invasive looking blood pressure as a continuous arterial waveform and it'll use the area under the curve of the arterial waveform and project a cardiac output. So did you know if you have EV1000, so it wouldn't be present in the older EV1000, but any EV1000 that's been purchased in the last four years and any new hemisphere monitors, those are the ones for your PA catheter, but also will allow you to look at flow track and clear sight going forward. So at Grady, we have six flow tracks that also have clear sight with them. And we have two hemispheres that have clear sight with them. Did you know you have that capability? So all EV1000s that we purchased in the last two years has this capability. And if you need training on it, I can definitely arrange that. It's a very nice non-invasive methodology, which then displays very similarly to what your flow track device does. It displays very similarly a, a pulsatile waveform, uh, incorporating that as a continuous blood pressure, a stroke volume, cardiac output, stroke volume index, cardiac index, et cetera. Same exact things you can get from your flow track, but this is non-invasive. So it's really quite lovely and it's quite helpful to us to know that we have that capability. Okay, so Here's the monitor. I'm just showing you what it looks like on the monitor. This is very similar to what you see when you're using an arterial-based cardiac output, but this is clear sight. You see that down here, it says clear sight. And what I'm looking at here is the patient's pulsatile rate, their measured cardiac index, which is very poor, and their stroke volume index, which is very poor. Normal stroke volume index is uh, 35 to 45, and normal cardiac index is 2.5 to 4. This patient has very poor blood flow. If I was looking at his perf number on the monitor, it would probably be about 0 0.33. He has very poor blood flow. So you're now going to resuscitate his blood flow dynamic. He might be hypotensive as well, but you're going to give volume. You might consider an inotrope, and you're going to use vasopressors only to maintain the mean arterial pressure. And what you're really resuscitating here would be his blood flow dynamic, his cardiac output index, stroke volume, and stroke volume index. Okay. The next step is thoracic bioimpedance. So currently, uh, we have, I think, agreed to purchase two of these monitors. They used to be called the Cheetah Monitor. They're now called Starling. They will be primarily used in the MICU as a non-invasive methodology that our, our medical ICU doctors feel is very reliable. Probably actually roll over a little bit to the emergency department, although we're gonna start in the emergency department with the clear site technology. And thoracic bioimpedance basically actually looks at impedance through the thoracic cage, which will change every time the ventricle ejects. As blood is in the thoracic cage, as the ventricle ejects, that will change the impedance. So what it basically is, is between four electrode pads, large electrode pads, there's actually a low voltage applied to the patient and it's looking at the change in that frequency. It is non-invasive. It's not minimally invasive. It's non-invasive. Looks really good in healthy patients, but in patients, the sicker the patient, the more uh, 
the more difficulty that thoracic bioimpedance has in reading patients. Let, let me make sure you appreciate. Same with clear sight, same with perfusion index. The sicker the patient, the harder it is to use non-invasive or minimally invasive technologies to actually predict the patient's stroke volume and cardiac output. In those cases, you really need an echocardiogram or you need a pulmonary artery catheter. So you can see that older, really older patients, patients who are having big fluid shifts, who have pulmonary edema, myocardial infarction, those patients may not actually be well monitored with these non-invasive strategies. But for a general application, whoops, gonna start with perfusion index or perfusion. I'm gonna look at your pleth. I'm gonna to move to a clear site or I'm gonna to move to a bioimpedance or if you have uh, other, other methodologies like partial gas rebreathing or other methodologies, an ICOM, other things like that, you can utilize those tools as well. At Grady, we have for non-invasive monitoring uh, cardiac output, we have clear site and we will have the Starling device. So we've got two devices that we can apply for non-invasive cardiac output. And those will be available for all critical care units and for the emergency department as well. Okay, so that I just wanna show you that Starling methodology. So here are the electrode pads that you place on the patient. And one of their number one goals is uh, with Starling is to talk about whether or not patients are fluid responsive. So it's actually monitoring the shift in the stroke volume or what we call stroke volume variation, but most particularly looking at shift in stroke volume after giving a passive leg raise. So the Starling device, putting the four pads on the patient is also bound to a passive leg raise. So your legs are lifted. There's a wedge pillow that you put the legs upon and your patient boluses himself with three to 500 mLs of volume when the legs are lifted. And you can actually see, did the ventricle accept it and eject it because the stroke volume will either go up or it won't go up when you lifted the legs. If you lift the legs and the stroke volume goes up, that means your patient is fluid responsive. But I wanna be sure we all appreciate that fluid responsiveness is not necessarily measuring cardiac output. So I love this device for fluid responsiveness. I think it's an excellent device for fluid responsiveness, but it is not a continuous measurement device. And you have to have, you know, you have to have a dynamic measure lifting the legs or giving fluid to actually make some good clinical decisions. But it's an excellent device. Uh, it was at one time was owned by Cheetah has now been purchased by Baxter. It's now called the Starling because it's looking at the Starling curve and it will project heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output and stroke volume variation as well as cardiac index and stroke volume index. Those are just calculations. So this is something that's gonna be newer for, for us at Grady. It's been around for quite a while, over 10 years uh, in its former iteration as the Cheetah device. Now the Starling device, since it's been purchased, and we've just recently entered into an agreement to purchase some of these devices. So a lot more to come after we've done that to see how we're going to utilize it. It is non-invasive. It is nurse supplied, which is fantastic, right? With an echocardiogram or with an indwelling transesophageal echo, echo or with uh, partial gas rebreathing. Those are all physician driven. This is nurse driven. The nurse puts the pads on does a passive leg raise, calibrates the equipment, does the passive leg raise and evaluates the patient. So this is quite wonderful because this puts power in the hand of the nurse who's at the bedside dealing with the patient who's hypotensive, trying to make a good decision about whether they're asking for volume or whether they're asking for vasopressors in the face of hypotension, hypoperfusion. So remember in today's world, giving volume ad hoc is murderous to patients. It links to ARDS, it links to acute kidney injury. So we really want to find methodologies that help us to focus and give appropriate fluid volume. So this device is going to help us with that. And again, it's really looking at fluid responsiveness. And of course, when it does that, it gives us a stroke volume, which also then allows us to calculate a cardiac output. Okay.
Another non-invasive method is partial gas rebreathing. That's called the NICO system, it's Novometrics, and it's actually using an indirect FIC principle to calculate cardiac output. Very few people that I know are using this. It, of course, does require your patient is intubated on mechanical ventilation, but what it's actually doing is correlating the amount of CO2 that you're exhaling proportional to the uh, cardiac output. So as cardiac output goes up, you're going to exhale more CO2, and as cardiac output goes down, you're going to exhale less CO2. Now, you know what? You already know that, don't you? You certainly know that because you know the number one method of measuring accuracy and adequacy of compressions is end tidal CO2. The better the compression, the higher the end tidal CO2. If your end tidal CO2 is less than 15, your compression isn't, isn't adequate. And that's all about blood flow. So this really looks at the, the continuous evaluation of whether or not your carbon dioxide goes up or goes down and correlates that to cardiac output. Now, it also mimics something that I love to talk about, but today I don't think I'm going to have time. And that is the indicator of venous minus arterial carbon dioxide. So basically drawing from an A-line and a central line at the same time, drawing the blood gas, sending it off to the lab. When it comes back, what I want to see is the difference between venous CO2, which is produced carbon dioxide, minus arterial CO2, which is remaining carbon dioxide, V minus A CO2 should always be five or less. Okay, that's normal. Any gradient difference greater than 10 always means you have a poor cardiac output. Now that's really simple. So let me say it again. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it another time. It's not really part of this talk, but it is a minimally invasive way for you to evaluate your patient. You have a central line, you have an A line, you draw a blood gas at the exact same time. So you need two people, one at the arterial line, one at the central line. You draw the blood gas at the same time, you run the labs, and then you take the venous CO2 and subtract the arterial CO2. That difference between venous and arterial should be less than five. Now you've got a kind of a gray area between five and 10. Anything that's greater than 10 indicates to you that you have a very low cardiac output. So now your focus is gonna become about treating the cardiac output. So I, I wanted you to have just that little piece of information. I've, I've talked about this a lot. This just shows you about the volumetric CO2, which is what we call the rebreathing or the partial rebreathing principle that helps us to evaluate cardiac output. So now let me move forward to, and I'm talking fast because I have a lot to say and I want to be respectful of your time. Okay, so now let's talk about minimally invasive cardiac output. So remember, this is a multiplex. There's so many different ways that we can look at cardiac output. So things like LITCO, lithium dilution, uh, PICO, which is, uh, is cool injectate dilution, flow track, um, and esophageal Doppler, transesophageal echocardiography. These are minimally invasive, and they are all based on what we call pulse contour analysis, um, not the echo, but everything else, everything that's measured at the arterial level, LIDCO, PICO, flow track, all looking at pulse contour analysis. So basically looking at the area under the curve from the beginning of systole to the end of systole, which is the dichrotic notch, looking at that area under the curve and utilizing that to actually talk about stroke volume. So that cardiac output is very significantly affected by the area under the curve and also the upstroke of systole. Now think about patients that you have that don't have a dichrotic notch because they have mitral sten uh, or aortic stenosis. They don't have a dichrotic notch, so they just have a slide down. In those patients, you're not going to be able to do pulse contour analysis to measure the cardiac output. So that area under the systolic part of the arterial waveform is proportional to stroke volume. So if you've ever listened to me, you know, I talk a lot about systolic pressure is representative of a response to volume or inotrope. When you see systolic pressure go up, you know that the patient is responding to your therapy. And that's the same thing we're looking at here, is the area under the curve of the systolic component of the arterial pressure. And that's what's gonna be utilized in pulse contour analysis. So that contour is actually, actually calculated using a non-calibrated or calibrated signal, 
calculated into stroke volume. And that's what's going to be utilized to tell you about cardiac output. What you're actually measuring here, and that's really important, with your arterial-based pulse contour analysis, you are measuring stroke volume and calculating cardiac output. So that's why the focus really has to be on stroke volume because that's what you're measuring. The, these technologies also give you, as well as the uh, as well as the Starling, give you the capability to look at a dynamic response measure known as stroke volume variation for fluid responsiveness. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Okay. So some folks use LIDCO, lithium derived, and what that requires is a central line and an arterial line, and you bolus lithium into the venous line, and that arterial concentration is measured, and that predicts your cardiac output. Requires calibration every eight hours and during any major hemodynamic change. I have only worked with it very, very, very briefly. I probably did six patients who had LIDCO or lithium derived calculations. And I can tell you that I, I think it's a great device, but it's very nurse intensive because you've got to do this calibration and evaluation and inject with lithium. And it, it's just a cumbersome process. But if that's what you have, fantastic. Use it well. Make sure you're using it correctly. So again, arterial and venous line. This is an older model projection, but you can see what happens is as that lithium is detected, you actually can measure the cardiac output. If you have a CVP, and of course you do because you're using that central line, you get SDR, you get MAP, blood pressure, and all of the accoutrements that go along with stroke volume. So stroke volume index, cardiac output, and cardiac index. Flow track system. Now we we use flow track at our institution. I think flow track is probably the most common methodology for using minimally invasive cardiac output monitoring worldwide. It's probably the most common methodology. Now flow track is the transducer. So when docs say I want to put the patient on a Vigileo, what what are you talking about? Vigileo is the name of the monitor that has been out of press for fifteen years. We use a flow track transducer and we attach it to an EV1000 or a hemisphere. Those are the names of the monitors. What's really important here is the transducer. And the transducer is called flow track. This is minimally invasive and it requires only an arterial line. Doesn't require a venous catheter, only an arterial line. Now, some folks' issue with the flow track is that it does not have an external calibration. It's internally calibrated based on the pulsatile waveform. But it's a pretty uh, functional and relatively efficient methodology of evaluating the area under the curve of the systolic limb of the arterial pressure. But again, patients who are very vasodilated, they're septic, uh, patients who get liver transplants, patients with acute liver failure, may have a little bit of inaccuracy and the flow track can become less reliable just like all of the other minimally and non-invasive methodologies in patients who have loss of vascular tone, patients who have significant valvular dysfunction, patients who are on intraortic balloon pump or impella, you lose some of the validity of that signal when you're utilizing this. So again, I just wanna remind you, we're talking about the area under the curve here. Now. This green dotted line right here is representing your mean arterial pressure. It's looking at the area under the curve between both systole, dichrotic notch, and diastole, whereas arterial contour, pulse contour technology for cardiac output is really just looking at the area under that systolic pressure. Okay, so that just reminds you about pulse pressure, which mimics stroke volume systole minus diastole. Now here's my flow track. And again, looking very similar to what I saw before, it basically allows me to monitor continuously cardiac index output, stroke volume variation, stroke volume index, and other measures. There's quite a menu of measures that you can make when you have arterial-based cardiac output. And what we're looking at here is just a trend graph that shows you what's occurred for the patient. Right here, your patient got a liter and a half of volume, and you can see what happened when they got the volume, their cardiac index, and their stroke volume went up significantly. And that was wonderful to actually see that effect 
as it's occurring, when you gave the volume, seeing those changes for the patient. So now you just look at it again. This is pre the volume administration. You can see the patient has a low index and output, uh, a low stroke volume, stroke volume index, and stroke volume variation is high. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, not too much because it's not really about cardiac output. Okay, another methodology, and again, we don't really use this at Grady, but it is good for us to know about this. Uh, this is something that Dr. Greg Martin, who is our medical ICU uh, division chair, he used to be the medical director of the MICU. He is no longer that. He has handed that off to Sima Tekwani, but he is just he's so fantastic in research and publication and knowledge and hemodynamics. And about 12 years ago, he did a study using this device, the PICO device, looking at fluid responsiveness uh, and the administration of volume follow 25% uh, albumin followed by Lasix in patients who had fluid overload, but who are who were arterially hypovolemic. And he used this device. This is when I became introduced to it. It was before I actually even was at Grady uh, reading what Greg Martin had written about utilizing this device. Again, this device requires both a central line and a femoral arterial line. It's a special femoral arterial line. So not just a standard placement of a cat arterial catheter, like you could place with your Lidco or your flow track, you have to use a specialized arterial catheter when you're using the Pico device. Now that's not necessarily a problem. It, it actually gives you an abundance of information that talks about interstitial volume load that's called extravascular lung water, really looked to be something that was gonna change the way we managed ARDS patients in particular, but it just never caught on uh, most likely because it was relatively nurse intensive. So the discussion was, well, I've got to put in a femoral A-line. I have to have a special catheter. I have to give my patient cool fluid. Why wouldn't I just use a PA catheter? I feel more comfortable with that. And now we don't really even use the PA catheter. But the Pico device was made by Pulsion, actually a fantastic device, giving us really great information, also giving us something separate that we don't get with FlowTrack and that we don't get with Lidco and we don't get with Starling. And that is not only stroke volume variation, which is the variability of stroke volume related to breathing, but also pulse pressure variation. And having both those numbers gives us a whole new window on therapeutic alterations. So on here's on your PICO monitor. And here you see, here is your cardiac index, 4.52. Here's your global and diastolic index, meaning your fluid load totally, and how much water is in your extravascular space. So really a lot of capabilities beyond just basic cardiac output. And again, didn't really catch on. They use it a lot in Europe. We don't use it much in America. You're probably in your career. We'll probably never come across it, but you might. And now you know, at least you have a basic understanding. This is a methodology that we use to look at cardiac output. And of course, gold standard, gold standard is the echocardiogram. PA catheter is not the gold standard. Echocardiogram is the gold standard. The echocardiogram allows us to look at the diameter of both right and left ventricle, lets us look at septal wall movement, lets us look at whether there is dynamic contraction, dyskinetic or hypokinetic contraction. It's really, really important. And it also lets us look at fluid challenge if we want to use our echocardiogram for that purpose. But echocardiogram, I want to remind everybody, is the gold standard of hemodynamics. It's what's really the best methodology for evaluating ventricular efficiency, ejection fraction, stroke volume, and therefore cardiac output. So whenever you can get an echocardiogram, you have any questions about the validity of whatever it is you're using to monitor your patient, you have concerns about their ventricular integrity, you always need an echocardiogram. Now this is the continuous uh, transesophageal Doppler. This is called this this device is called the CardioQ, and this actually in Europe is utilized by nurses trained nurses who drop that Doppler probe and the Doppler probe has to position itself right behind the atria in the esophagus. That's why it's transesophageal continuous echocardiogram, which also will then of course display cardiac output, 
stroke volume, et cetera, all the parameters that we're used to and that we feel like we need when we're monitoring our patients and it gives us lots of beneficial information. This is basically the external Doppler probe. That's what most of us are using is external Doppler. That's also known as POCUS. POCUS or external Doppler also can give us a great display of cardiac output. But I wanna remind you that you don't wanna confuse volume responsiveness with cardiac output. Volume responsiveness means that the ventricle responds to volume. Volume is a therapy and the cardiac output will ultimately improve. But volume responsiveness is just about testing ventricular efficiency and the ability of the ventricle to accept its volume. And we use some dynamic parameters that I've already talked about, right? I've talked about pulse pressure variation, talking about stroke volume variation. And the other thing that we can talk about is systolic pressure variation. So first and foremost, I've got an A-line. I have no device whatsoever. So don't get, don't get thrown because the color and the label here is very strange to you, I'm quite sure. This is an older Philips technology, but it's such an incredibly fantastic view that I always show it. I went in the room, I changed the label on my arterial line to PA because I wanted to be able to have a movable cursor. And I compressed it in a sweep speed to 6.25. So what you're seeing here is a basic wedge window that has my arterial pressure in a scale of 160 or 150. It's labeled PA, but it's arterial pressure. And you can see that because the pressure is 143 over 67. And it correlates with their respiration. So every time the respiratory cycle goes up, no matter whether it's positive pressure or negative pressure breathing, it's about bioimpedance through the chest. Every time the patient takes a breath, the respiratory waveform goes up, whether it's positive pressure or spontaneous. And when they exhale, it goes down. That's in terms of the respiratory waveform. That respiratory waveform is then correlated to my arterial waveform. So again, you don't need to put it into PA or into the wedge window because you don't have a big wedge window anymore. All you have to do is put it at 6.25 sweep speed. So you go in, you click onto the wave, you go down to change sweep speed and you go to 6.25. What that means is you're gonna get a lot of data in a short period of time because we're compressing the data. And what you see here is a significant amount of variation that is associated with breathing. Now, why do we care about this? Why we care about this is because as we uh, incur positive pressure breathing, every time the positive pressure goes into the thoracic cage, it compresses the pulmonary vessels and can limit the forward flow of volume from right ventricle to left ventricle. So we look at this stroke volume variation and we say stroke volume variation is meaningful to us when we have patients who are on positive pressure breathing. And what we're actually evaluating is whether or not we have adequate volume to overcome the increased resistance that occurs every time the patient takes a breath. So first, this is just very primitive. What I did here, and this again was with older technology, I labeled the arterial line PA, I put it into a wedge window, and then I was able to move the cursor to look at the highest systole and the lowest systole and look at the difference between the two. And that gave me systolic pressure of variation. In today's world, we talk more about pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. They are very similar. So I'm really gonna just use one terminology, but on your flow track, your clear site, your Starling, your Pico, your Lidco, you can always look at stroke volume variation, which is the variability of volume that the right ventricle fills and ejects with across the pulmonary bed affected by breathing. Okay, so very, very uh, uh, specific algorithm, which is max minus min divided by mean. Who cares? You don't care. You don't need to calculate it. It's calculated for you. You don't really care. But greater than a 13% variability indicates that you have a patient who is likely to be volume responsiveness. Now, you've got to control a couple of things. You've got to control ventilation. They have to be on positive pressure breathing. It really needs to be controlled, so they need to be on assist control, and it should be about eight mLs per kg. That means that in order for me to make these measures using the technology that I have at the bedside, I can't do that continuously. I can only do it intermittently because I'm not going to ventilate patients at eight mLs per kg. 
And maybe the patient is vented with SIMV, but in order for me to read an appropriate stroke volume variation, I must be on ACMV at eight mLs per kg. So for those of you who work in the intensive care unit, you cannot continuously display stroke volume variation. It's not adequate, it's not accurate, you're, you're monitoring it incorrectly, and you're giving incorrect information. You have to be very focused Assist control ventilation, eight mLs per kg. And you do that for two minutes, and then you make your stroke volume variation measure. It's not a continuous measurement that's been completely disbanded by anybody in hemodynamics around the world, and including the vendors who originally only talked about stroke volume variation. Now they don't even talk about that anymore. Okay, so here you can look at this patient. They're on positive pressure breathing and they have very little variation, but you can't eyeball it. It's got to be actually calculated. And the end variation is 5%. That means if your patient's hypotensive, they are not going to be volume responders. If your patient has a very significant pulse pressure variation, so again, positive pressure, exhalation, positive pressure, exhalation, positive pressure, exhalation, you've got this huge variability is 32%. This is a patient who is likely to be a fluid responder. Remember the caveat. So it used to be you couldn't be an AFib. That's not true anymore. The only caveat is you must be on positive pressure breathing with assist control, eight mLs per kg for all devices except for one, sorry. And that's the Starling device. Starling device, you can look at stroke volume variation on a spontaneous breather. You don't need to actually have this controlled ventilatory uh, command. Okay, so what we this is basically what we're talking about here is something you learned when you were in nursing school. You took a CCRN exam or a CEN exam or whatever exam you took. You learned about this as pulses paradoxes. Patient takes a breath and their systolic pressure drops. This is a reverse pulses paradoxus. That is that when you get a positive pressure breath, you're pushing volume out of the left ventricle, but then the left ventricle has less volume loading. And so what you have is this variability that is persistent and consistently related to breathing. And that's called stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation. So if I just take a quick look at this patient, and I'm going to say on that patient, you can see he has a lot of variability. And we give him a liter bolus, and you see that his variability has decreased. So my ball always bounces all around. But the first patient, the first, the first look on this patient, their stroke volume was around 28. We gave a, uh, gave a liter of volume, and the stroke volume increased to about 32. And what we saw, of course, was the disappearance of the variability. And that's a really good indicator that we had a patient who responded to volume. Now that isn't necessarily about cardiac output. It's about whether or not volume as a therapy improved your cardiac output. But it's actually, whenever you talk about stroke volume variation, what you're doing is evaluating therapeutic intervention to actually get a good idea about what's occurring for patients. The other thing that's really important is remember we talked about that passive leg raise and tidal carbon dioxide is actually better than arterial pressure for predicting fluid responsiveness. So if I lift your legs, I put your legs on a pillow and lift them to 45 degrees, it's a specialized pillow, or I have a leg lift on my stretcher or my bed where I can lift the legs, patient is bullishing himself with three to 500 mLs of volume from his legs, his end tidal CO2 increases, what that means is you have better blood flow and your patient's a volume responder. It's very simple. As you increase the blood volume back to the heart by lifting the legs, you see the end-tidal CO2 goes up. That means your patient is fluid responsive. But of course, one of the best ways to look at fluid responsiveness that all your doctors love, that most of your APPs love, is collapsibility of your central veins. So they're going to take they're going to take their echo device, their ultrasound device, and they're going to look at whether or not when they compress can they compress the vein? If they can compress the vein by utilizing pressure, that typically means that your patient is volume underloaded. If the veins are very dilated and non-compressible, the patient will not receive volume. So last but not least, uh, so it's 16.59, five o'clock. Um, I'm very happy to end here and continue next week talking about invasive monitoring, which would be both continuous and intermittent cardiac output plus
FIC calculation, depending on where you work. You might have docs that want to do that. Uh, I think the next part will probably take 15 to 20 minutes. So I, I feel like it's a good idea for us to end here. We've had a lot of information and we're going to continue this next Wednesday as part two of the multiplex of cardiac output. I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing and stop recording. And then I'm going to be available for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for attending today. I appreciate it greatly. And bye-bye for now.